Welcome to Vice Grip Garage. On this episode, we're gonna dig all the way down deep into this 1972 Chevrolet Chevelle. I call it Independence. And if you haven't seen the episode yet where I brought this girl home, you should probably go ahead and hook your peepers on that. There's a thing floating in over here, just click on it. Today's goal is you're actually gonna help me determine what kind of build to do with this girl. So stick around to the end, it's important. We gotta, you know, look at the frame actually, cause I kinda just, you know, only looked at one side. Maybe we could fix it, probably not. Great. Front end shot. I mean, it's more wild than Charlie Sheen and the engine is just tired, it's had it. So I'm gonna show you a couple ways that you could diagnose on your engine with just some cheap everyday tools. Hopefully save you from pulling the old girl out. And then last and most certainly least, We'll actually figure out what the engine is. 305, 307, maybe a 350. I don't know. We'll figure out later. Guy never has a plan, but I did make a list this time so my brain can remind me. And what I'm thinking is, we should probably shoot her up on some jack stands first, so we can snip these wheels off, and that way a guy can waller his head around in there and kind of really see what's going on. I haven't really looked at this side over here because, well, I just wanted to ignore it. We know this side's pretty rotten already. Down here, front of the wheel which is really typical and then right up here where she bends and swoops and snags just spent 39 years looking for my hubcap removal tool you got to be delicate on these older units especially these metal ones get out of here come on now all i ever do is jack stuff up around here i can't even think just run Oh yeah, I buy straight garbage, that's right. Well, when a guy was jacking up the rear here, I was basically chewing on the bumper and I'll be dipped if there ain't valve stems sticking out. And you know what that means. She's got air shocks. We might as well try those out. That line doesn't exist. Oh. Massive leak, but look at that. Let's bring her all the way up. What is that? I don't know. Well, sure. Something else that's junk. The guy's actually got a 79 Camaro build coming to the channel soon, so. I think I'm gonna hang on to these wheels. A little bit of sanding and tsst, They'll come right back around. Oh, hello, old friend. That's a real common trouble spot for A-body frames. I'll get my professional frame checker tool out here in a minute, but let's go see what the other side looks like. That might be more gooder. Just kind of ignore the rest of the goodness. What is that? Well, seeming how a guy's got a tremendous amount of work done already. It's lunchtime. Forgot to take the plastic off the cheese. Every time. You are not good at making sandwiches. Wow, how would you even No, no. There's a couple important things now here, fellas, that we're looking for when trying to determine, are you gonna fix this frame or are we gonna swap it? You've got the density of it, you've got the thickness and a couple other things, but there's a tool out there that will do it all for you. Well, clearly she shot right here, you know. Not so much here or here, 
But we got to check on that. So you're going to get your 12 ounce frame checker. Just check. You know, get it in here. Scanning. Check complete. Basically what we found is there's a hole right here and it's pretty good here and it's not so bad as here. So, you know, I think we could probably plate that. Let me scan again. Yeah, it scanned pretty good back here as well. Oh, hey, what are you gonna tell us? Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah. Call that a B plus. Get out of there. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. Gotta fix this. Get out of there. Got a little bit of rot right in here. Yeah, pretty typical. You know, a guy can really tell because there's nothing on the floor after the tests there, you know. She's been cared after. I mean, someone took the time and just took care of her. But as suspected, the frame's got more holes in her than Bonnie and Clyde, so we've got some work to do. I'm thinking a plate here, we just bring her on the bottom. Then maybe a chunk of angle iron right there. And then just a plate on the bottom on the driver's side, and that ought to bring this frame right back around. It'll be brand new. Well, help me understand how this works. There. Well, the frame inspection, that's done. And the good news is we can plate that. Let's move on to the front end inspection. This ought to be good. Well, we're trying to diagnose a problem here that's similar to riding a wagon through a stubble field. You basically just hang on and pray. I'm thinking the rag joint might be shot down here, but it is intact. But let's go ahead and test on it a little bit. A lot of you watching probably know what a rag joint is and how it works. So I'm just going to buzz the tower on this one. And here she is hiding right down here and there's a little piece of rubber or fabric or, I don't know, there's science in the middle there. And what that's supposed to do is take the vibration out of the go left, go right selector in the cabin there. And I found they're really handy when the belts come out of your rotten tires at 105 when you're doing a full pull. Most of them will have tabs like this or some sort of configuration. When this guy in here wears out, then they, you know, they hook up so you can still steer the rig. What is this wire to now? I don't know. You're going to need a rag joint tester 200 and just jam this down in there like that. And now when you crank on her, she's going to shoot into the frame and then you can see how much waller you got in her. Well, yeah, she shot. You can see here without any pressure on her, it's almost touching already. And then we got this big gap over here. 
And then take your tester and you can just kind of jam it in here and then flex on it. And that's way too easy. And also about 14 feet too much movement. So this is definitely bad, but I'm gonna say it's not the whole reason the front's out. Definitely a contributing factor, but everything I own has a bad rag joint and I know what that feels like. Well, the guy's gonna clean up a tickle, you know, so I can get underneath the old girl and we'll check out the ball joints and the tie rods and whatever other geometry sticks there are down there. Where's that broom? I wonder what Sylvester Stallone's doing today. Hmm. Well, 7% of the frame is laying on the ground, but I'm not even mad. We're gonna pick up some serious time in the 60 foot. Well, let's start on the driver's side and inspect it, and then we'll scooch over to the passenger side. The guy likes to turn these all the way one way and then bring them back the other way. And that'll help highlight any issues in here. I can already see this is shot. I'll show you that in a second. But I noticed this right away too, and that's from the pin being at full lock. So someone had the wheel cranked all the way to the left, but that's indented. I mean, that's severe. I don't know if they drug her through a cornfield at 80 with the wheels turned or what, but if you've ever seen that and you know what it's from, put her down on the bleep bloop box. Sway bar bushings are shot. Let's see what the front tells us here. So this, yep, that's fine. But that guy, she's, that's, that's an F on the Richter scale there. She's shot. And that's why this tire is kind of just, you know, doing what it wanted to do. Um, that's not good. That's the tie rod rubbing on the cross member. And that's more not gooder. That's the center link. It actually wore a groove into the cross member. Great. So either this is bent or the steering box is pushed back. Maybe the frame's bad up here. Someone changed the pitman arm, or maybe it's because of the tickle of rot right there, or could just be all of it. <sighs> More junk. Well, the guy's been staring down this frame for about 19 days now. Surprisingly, that steering box, I mean, she's, it's in there. I don't see any cracks or rot, but I don't think I'll be able to move it enough. I mean, I can just tickle her forward a skosh, but I need like a full quarter inch in there, or for you Canadians watching, that's about 419 centimeters. So I think it's a bent center link in combination with a, just a touch of frame rottage, but I mean, it's, it's bad wrong. Perfect. Looks like the tie rod's not rubbing on this side. And even better news, we got one of those high performance upper ball joints over here too. And those automatically adjust the camber, you know, so it maximizes your algebra and really gets you around those corners. Bottom ball joints, fine. Of course, typical sway bar stuff. So this side, not so bad from the front. I'll shoot her over this way and we'll get behind it. Nothing exciting on the back end. Don't have the same issue down here. But the light caught the frame just right, and look what I found. She is split, and it goes halfway underneath the frame as well. And that's an even more badder problem. Definitely explains all the flex from the rot down here and then being broken up here. That's why, you know, the front just kind of, you know, does whatever it wants to do. Gonna change this to three plates. And then we got a nice big crack in there. And what makes this really fun is, I don't have a lift, so to do a frame swap would be a pain in the rear. Plus, you know, frames cost money, so there's that too. And if we take the body off, then I'm gonna probably end up fixing the body mounts because they're rotted and there's nothing to, you know, hook it up. And then you might as well put a floor in it. And without a title, that doesn't really make sense. This is going really good. Day two now, here I am. Let's dig into the old engine here. I mean, it runs, but it's like a one-legged man tap dancing. It just doesn't sound right. 
First step is snag the hood off. This custom hood prop, you know, she's made for Chevelle's, but it'll also work for, say, Monte Carlo's. Look at this wood grain. If and a guy wants to keep his hood alignment up, you know, you can run some tape around here or even a marker, and then when you plop her back on, you know right where to put it. So I'm gonna do the right thing and just skip all of that. Easy. All right, let's see if we can bend the corners out of this. Sure. Well, what is that now? I don't know. First test I want to run is a compression test, and I like to heat them up, you know, for that test. And you can do it cold, but your values are going to be down there, so you got to take that into consideration. So I guess we'll see if this still fires up. Bring the thunder. Nothing. Bring the thunder again. Still nothing. How about now? Let's try to bring it right now. Well, help me understand. Maybe I need to shim the starter a little bit. One shim ought to do. Here we go now. Well, she's nice and toasty now. I shut her down, I got a water neck leaking and the heater hose. She's, you know, this one here, you gotta be gentle. She's about ready to pop. I'm definitely hearing a miss over here on the ear meter, and I was banging on the frame yesterday. Number eight cylinder down there had some oil just weeping out of her by the sparkulator. So it's gonna be interesting to see what we find over there. And of course, we got the oil leak up front here. And then what's leaking on the dangled concrete is the oil pressure gauge. She's tied in back here and surprised they messed that up. So that's dumping oil to beat heck. So I'm gonna let the, you know, the smoke get out of here cause I just, I can't breathe. And then we'll get the sparkulators out and the lightning hoses. Well, everything is just bound up in here. Yeah, that's routed around the windshield washer pump. Ah. This manifold's hot, and I ain't kidding you. I'll use my left hand. That one's, you know, she's a dummy. Oh, wow. Well, the guy's got all the sparkulators out, and, you know, as expected, they're all fouled. I mean, She's running richer than Oprah, and that's okay. Normally I'd just, you know, jet this down, maybe even change a rod or a spring. But on that last trip, I was in such a hurry, I forgot to grab my cases like this. This is actually for a 1405, that's a 1411, but all the kits are the same. They come with uh, the rods, jets, springs, everything like that. Super easy to work on. These Edelbrocks just pop the top off and away you go. What I'm more so looking at is the number four and number eight were completely oil soaked on the threads and the shaft of the old sparkulator. And typically that would mean, you know, the rings. They're just, they're not doing what they're supposed to do. And after all the driving I did on this, normally those rings would come right back around if they were just gummy or stuck. So we'll move on to the compression test now and. That'll tell us just, you know, a little bit more. One of the questions I get asked 348,000 times a week is, what should my cranking compression be? I don't know. What in the, what, what, what is in the, what's the engine? 
What's your static compression? What's your valve overlap? I mean, I can't really help you out there. There's, there's some calculators on the interwebs that you can search up, and unless you got a factory engine, usually you can find them on the interwebs too, what it should be. You know, I can tell you on these worn out 350s, just from being around them all my life, you know, smogger heads, four relief pistons, you're gonna be in that 115 to 135 range, somewhere around there. Some strong engines, you might be up towards 150, but it's not necessarily that number I'm looking at. You know, a guy's more looking at, what is the consistency of all the cylinders? And 10 to 15% variance, if you got one under 100, for example, and one at 135, she's that one, she's down, you know, you got an issue. So I'm gonna start cranking on this and then we'll write down the number we get next to all the sparkulators and see what it'll tell us. Guy went ahead and installed his, I'm a Lone Wolf 6000 trigger. And that's sure nice, guy doesn't have to walk back and forth to the old cabin. And then just a reminder to get your Throttle Jammer 2000 out, and you want to modulate your throttle to 100%. And then if you don't take the old lightning whirler off like I did, make sure you know you want to unplug that. And I think we're ready to rock. Let's crank on it and see what it says. Okay, 1.30. Sure. Went ahead and hooked up the storm maker. That way we don't kill the battery and then we get a consistent cranking RPM here. Vamanos mi amigo cilindro tres. I gave her a couple extra turns, but 120 is all she's got. <laughs> Listen, I just, I just need you to land somewhere you know, give me, give me 125. Nope. Well, I did go ahead and find my way over here to cylinder four and she's suspect. So let's see what this one says. Here we go. Nay, it says I'm good. 124. Guys finally got all of them done here and it's looking pretty good, actually. It's not bad. The highest is cylinder one at 130, and the lowest is actually cylinder three at 120. And our suspect cylinders four is 124, and eight is 128. So what do we do with all this information now, right? Well, here's the thing. If you ask 10 mechanics, what does this mean? You're gonna get 14 answers and about seven maybes. So I'm just gonna tell you what I think, and. It's probably wrong. This is telling me that the oil that we're getting on the plugs here isn't from our oil rings. It's most likely gonna be from bad valve seals, which makes complete sense after this sitting forever. They just dry it up. Compression wise, you know, highest to lowest, we're looking at the percentage difference. You got 130 to 120. That's 8.33333333333333. Percent difference. For some, that's borderline, but for me, eh, I'd still run her if I needed to, but it's a little bit inconsistent, so it's showing signs of probably needing some rings. Next, we can dig into the valve train because that's most likely our entire issue of why she's running rough, and it could be a number of things. Quite a bit to a valve train here. She could be burnt valves, it could be just valve lash adjusted incorrectly, loose rocker, bent push rod, collapsed lifter, could be a worn out cam lobe. And I'm gonna show you a cheap, easy way to test all that. And the nice thing is, all a guy's gotta do is snip off a valve cover. You don't really gotta dig into her. Ouch, she snagged me. Before we jump into this test, if you're one of them valve train wizard guys, you might want to just scooch down to the fridge and grab a cold snack. Otherwise, you know, just lean forward in your chair and maybe just pay, you know, a little bit more attention. It's important to understand the relationship between the camshaft and the lifter before we do this test. 
This test only works on flat tappet lifters and hydraulic flat tappet lifters, not the roller flavor, okay? So what happens when that camshaft is rotating in the engine is that lifter is actually spinning with it. It's spinning on the cam lobe. And the reason that happens is the cam lobe is machined with a taper, so it's got a on it. And then the lifter bottom, although it looks flat to your, you know, your eye, she's actually got a crown in her, you know, it's So that forces it to rotate in its bore. And if she's not rotating, well, your lifter's junk or your cam lobe is junk, pretty much. So we're gonna take a test on the push rods and those push rods, they should be, you know, spinning in there as well because they're taking up that space between the lifter and the rocker. It's kind of that cushion. So if that lifter is rotating properly, ear go, the old push rod should be spinning in there as well. And that's, you know, it's gonna tell us a lot too. <sighs> that took way too long. Well, whatever. Step 46, subsection H, you know, go ahead and snip the valve cover off. Some people like to do this with the engine running and I don't. I mean, it's messier than Mariah Carey Live. You could throw down some cardboard or even cut out another valve cover in the center where you could see the rockers and push rods, but yeah. It just takes a little bit longer. You gotta keep spinning on the engine, but you're gonna get the same result. I also like to do one side at a time so my brain has enough power to kind of focus in and see what's going on. And then I'll snip over to the other side. First thing, visual inspection. Do you have all your rockers? You know, are they here? And do they seem to be where they should be? Jiggle on them, you know what I mean? Look at how many threads are exposed on your rocker arm stud. If you've got 48 million on one and two on another, you obviously got some issues and someone was in here adjusting on them. Visually right away here, all is well. I mean, looks pretty decent. Take a rag and wipe off the face of the push rod up here by the intake, you know, clean it up a little bit. And then we're just gonna take a marker. I carry this guy around, it's just a, what is this? I don't know, it's a paint marker. And we're gonna draw a line on the face of the push rods. So there you go, got them all marked up. And then we're just gonna spin the engine over and we should see those push rods rotating. Here we go. And clearly every single one of the push rods did rotate around. This one's starting to be real fun. You know, we can't rule out the fact that it could just be a bad intake gasket. You can't always test on them, you know, just by spraying down the valleys. Could even be a head gasket leaking between the cylinders. That'll cause a mess right now. Oh, look at here. So here's what a guy's looking at. Pay attention to the threads showing through the rocker nuts there. And it's consistent through the whole engine, except for these two guys hanging out down here. It's not a significant difference, but it's definitely enough. And I already checked the stud. It hasn't been drilled, tapped, or changed. So let's go ahead and run the test and see what that tells us. Okay, let's test the drinker side here. That was interesting. Well, a guy probably caught it with his eyes that the exhaust valve on cylinder two and six, the push rods were barely spinning in comparison to the rest of them. I mean, this guy was going to town and this guy wasn't spinning. So you might think, well, maybe loosen it up a little bit and see if she'll spin, but it's at zero lash. And so is this guy. And if I loosen them up anymore, we'd have a lot of clatter. And that's assuming that the lifter is pumped up. As long as it's not physically busted, it is. I mean, we've got plenty of oil pressure and it's ran. So there you go. Well, the way the engine's sitting right now, it's actually easier to pull for me. 
I can just plop on a carburetor plate and snag her out that way. So I'm gonna stop here and not take the intake or heads off. There's still a, you know, skosh, very small chance that there could be a bad intake gasket or head gasket and most likely needs a lot of valve work. I'm gonna go through the heads anyway and I would definitely replace the cam and lifters. Uh, so I'm happy with it. It's got compression. We know that the bottom end's good, obviously. It builds good oil pressure, so it's a good rebuildable unit. I'm gonna hang on to her. We should probably go ahead and decode it and figure out what the heck it is though, huh? Yeah, probably. Great, more work. There's two different ways to do this. If you wanna know just kinda of generally, you know, what is this thing? Chevy's are easy, just the casting number behind the head there on the driver's side. If you wanna know exactly what the thing is, then there's a pad up here behind the alternator that you're gonna to wanna to get to, and then also pull the valve cover off and that'll tell you some more information. I've always used nastyz28.com. It's a really complete list. I'll shoot that down there in the what's this video about section. But we'll take a look at the casting number here. And we can see that that's 3970010. So I can already tell you most certainly that that's just a two bolt 350 run of the mill. But if we want to know when it was made, what did it come in, we're going to need some information down here. I snipped that alternator out of here so you can see better. But the other two sequences we need are right here. And I'm going to write those down on the whiteboard. And then we'll talk about, you know, what? That's a lot. What does that mean? And GM went ahead and made this easy too. Just that casting number right there is all you need. And that'll tell you everything you want to know. You guys probably can't see this, that's fine. Just, you know, pretend. So these are all the alphabeticals we snagged off the engine over there and we gotta break these down so we can figure out what they are. And don't worry, you don't have to remember all this stuff. You can use that interweb site. But some of these numbers, I remember off the top of my head because I've been doing this for 87 years. So the first one here, we break this out. C is Chevy, six is for 1976 and F is Flint. So we already know it went into a 1976 vehicle. This sequence here is the serial number partial VIN. So when people say they're looking for numbers matching, they're gonna take those digits there and they're gonna mash them up with the VIN number on the car and make sure they match. This sequence here, V also stands for Flint. And then this is actually a date. So it's June 23rd. And then TYZ, there's a section on that page too. You decode that with your decoder ring. And that shoots out 1975 Chevy Silverado pickup single cab. And that's where it gets a little confusing. Wait a second, this says 1975, but this says 1976. Well, this one wins because it has a VIN number. So this is when it was actually put to use. And that's because it was built in June 23rd, which is, you know, over the hump of halfway through the year. So they jammed her into a rig in the following year. There's also some out there that these three letters, they'll say, well, it could be a 305, maybe a 350. That's when you shoot down to this number here. This will always, you know, win the battle, so to speak, when it comes down to that. So you take a look at that and say, yep, you know, in our case, she's a 350. Long story short, 76 Chevy pickup, two bolt main, 354 barrel, 175 horse, very basic engine. The heads, uh, that's just a 76 cc, low compression, 19415 valves, uh, nothing fancy. You could punch them out to 202s, put some springs in them. You run these up to 375 horse probably. But I like all this, that's a good builder. I'm gonna hang on to her. Well, in summary, here's where we're at. You know, the frame on her, it's, she's shot, you know. But maybe a guy could booger weld in 42 pounds of wire, you know, and that'll bring the death potential down to about a 32.69% chance. And that's good. I mean, that's manageable. The engine needs rebuilt. I'm sure the transmission and rear end do too. And the best part is she don't got a title. And the chances of that happening are she don't got a title. 
part one, some of you were saying, you know, shoot her off the cliff in Alaska or chop her into a couch or let's put 714 pounds of tannerite in it and shoot it with a 50 cal and all of that is right down my sidewalk. But what I'm thinking is some sort of event where we could have fun and maybe meet some of you guys. So maybe rally cross, drag race, burnout car, drift car. I don't know. I'm going to rely on you guys. You're going to bleep bloop it down there in the comment box. We're going to scoop all that data together. And on the next video of Independence, we're going to let you know what kind of build we're doing. And keep it budget-minded for Pete's sake. Well, I think that's going to do it for this video. We got a lot done. If you're not subscribed yet, I would really appreciate that. Just hit that button there. If you want a capillator or a back rag, hit the website. There's also some other links down there. I'd appreciate you checking them out. Thanks for watching as always. See you next time. I am ready for supper. Let's get out of here.